Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream. Thanks very much for spending some time with us on the 16th of August 2022. Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. And uh, we're going to talk economics and all things economic tonight. And a very important conversation, of course, there's so much going on, so many new data points, so many questions, interest rates rising, house prices falling, CPI is pretty strong, wages growth pretty weak, and uh, rents going through the roof. So plenty to touch on. Before I uh, bring Leith in, let me just remind you that we don't provide specific financial legal advice in these shows, it's general conversation. The chat is moderated, uh, but please feel free to add your comments and questions. And uh, if you want to get your question direct to me, use at Walk the World to make sure I see it. So it comes into my queue. And we've also enabled Super Chat so that you can get your question top of the queue or indeed make a contribution to what we do here. We don't do this for profit. We do this because we care about the issues. So any contribution is greatly received and appreciated. Anyhow, with that, I'm going to bring Leith in. Hi, Leith. How are you going? Good day, Martin. Hello, everyone. Great to be on again. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming back. And uh, I know last time we were chatting, it was before the RBA had started its um, rate hiking cycle, and you were thinking 1.6, maybe. You know? Yeah. Oh no, I think we might. I think they might have done the first one. It was 0.25 then, but <laughs> it was very early on, and you know, the RBA dipped their toe in the water, did a normal a normal rate rise of 20. 0.25 and then straight after that it's been bang 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 uh you know 50 50 basis points each time and uh yeah it's, it's been a rude rude shock to a lot of people um certainly interesting times but I, I must admit you know doing what i do for a job i've haven't had this much fun uh watching <laughs> the housing market um you know the rba all all the shenanigans in probably 10 years so uh you know as much as i think they're going, to, they're going too far, or they will go too far. Um, I am enjoying it, I must admit. So, it, you know, it, 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 compare this to last year when we're in the middle of lockdowns in Melbourne, it was just miserable. Um, there was nothing really to, you know, I was just going through the motions a bit. It was just wasn't much fun, whereas this year it's actually enjoyable. You know, you've got a new government, uh, which just means new, um, you know, new ways they um, do us over. Uh, is, I'm trying, trying to trying to be polite, uh, and then obviously you know you got all the RBA shenanigans and the housing market and everything else. So it's just uh, yeah, it's been it's been an enjoyable start to the year, I must admit. And I guess one of the interesting questions is to what extent are the two sides of government different from each other, right? Because they seem to me to be behaving remarkably similarly in many ways. Well, in some ways, I'd argue Labor's in a lot of ways even more li neoliberal than the coalition. Um, yeah, in, in certainly in some ways. Um, now, I know we'll talk about it later, but we look just like we had the highest immigration ever under Kevin Rudd. We're going to looks like Albo is going to exceed that, so he's going to bend the knee to the business lobby, etc., and you know ramp up immigration to levels that Australia has never seen before. Um, because basically, big business, big property, the education slash migration industry wants it, um, and unfortunately, our weak unit unions are doing bugger all to push back. Um, and then at the same time, you know, you've got them kowtowing to the gas cartel. Who are royally, you know, bending us over to be polite, um, and yeah, there's, they're they're really they're they're great on virtue signalling, and sure they're going to do the anti-corruption commission, which is great, uh, but you know, on on these bigger issues, I think they're pretty useless, and it's just more of the same, if not worse, in some ways, because I honestly think we'd probably get better action on the gas cartel if the coalition was still in. I mean, they did uh, set up the AD GSM to start off with. Um, and we probably wouldn't get the sort of immigration outbreak that we're going to get now because effectively the Labor Party has set up this jobs and skills summit as a Trojan horse to ramp up immigration. So they conveniently didn't mention that they were going to do it during the election campaign. Both sides never mentioned immigration during the election campaign because they knew that the voters hate it. Well, they don't hate immigration, sorry. I don't hate immigration. They hate mass immigration, like extreme immigration. Um, so they never said they're going to you know, ramp it up to record levels. They didn't mention it at all. And then they've announced this jobs and skills summit, which is going to be chock full of the business lobby, you know, pro mass immigration, big Australia people, uh, plus the union movement who are pretty useless. And they're going to reach this consensus to raise immigration to its highest ever level. And it's been preordained, like I wrote about this months ago, that this is a Trojan horse. Um, and they're going to use this basically political cover to say, oh, but we consulted and we got, they came to this consensus to, even though they didn't consult the Australian people during 
the election campaign that was only a few months ago. So, um, yeah, look, I, I, I'm pretty disappointed in the Al- Albanese government, but then again, I didn't really expect much more out of them. I don't expect much out of Liberal, Labor, the, both Pepsi, Coke, or nor the Greens are really tab collar. So, um, you know, it's pick your poison, to be, to be quite honest. And I guess the part of the question which I've always had is to what extent is this simply because the underlying philosophy within Treasury is, is, is you know, fanatically neoliberalism? And oh, therefore, look, the, does it make much difference which side of politics is there? Because effectively, they're both dancing to the same Treasury tune. Yeah, and, and I must admit, when I was there, I got indoctrinated with it. I think I've said this before in this program, but, you know, I rocked up the Australian Treasury in 2003 and... Um, we got the first thing you do when you arrive there is you have one of these meetings and like all the new inductees come in. And at the time it was Ken Henry. And they drill into you this, you know, this well-being framework, biggest load of crap ever heard, but yeah, well-being framework, which at the time when you're young, you go, oh, cool, this sounds great. Um, and they drilled into us the three Ps, you know, the three, the three Ps is their equation to drive up the well-being of the Australian people. And it's, you know, um, Population, so immigration, productivity, and participation. So you want to basically, to them, it's boost immigration, like that grows the pie, so that's supposed to be good, even though the share of everyone's pie doesn't improve. Um, Boost productivity, no-brainer, should do that. And boost labour force participation, should do that. And I'd argue that of those three Ps, it's the last two that matter, yet the Treasury and the government always focuses on the first one because that's the easiest, even though it doesn't actually benefit us. Um, and uh, so I'm not saying zero, we should go for zero immigration, but what I'm saying is you certainly don't want to be going at, you know, more than double the historical average, which is what we've been doing in the last 15 years. It hasn't worked, uh, nor increasing it to even more extreme levels like it's been proposed. So unfortunately, while we're wedded to that three P's framework, which really should be two P's of productivity and participation, we're going to get these bogus outcomes. And the most ridiculous thing is, it is the Australian Treasury that seems to set immigration policy. Like they do the budget every year and they put these outlandish immigration figures uh, going forward. And then they do the intergenerational report, but report, which also has these outlandish immigration figures into for the next 40 years. So it's like the, it's, it's the tail wagging the dog. It's not the government setting the immigration figure and Treasury working around that. It seems to be Treasury working around that to give the budget outcomes they want, um, which are all based on BS modelling anyway. Um, and then that's why we're stuck with this, you know, stupid policy, which most Australians hate. And, um, but we can't mention because if you mention it, you're a xenophobic or racist. So it's just, um, it's just insane. Uh, and, and while they do this, they're just basically, you know, giving a free ride to, to big business, big property, the education migration industry, um, who get to privatize the gains while, the, all the costs and everything else are socialised on the rest of us. So, you know, that's, um, unfortunately, that's economic policy making in the, you know, property slash immigration narco state of Australia. So uh, here we are. <laughs> and there was this question came a little while ago. Could you explain how quantitative peopling is a replacement for quantitative easing? Is it because the money created by them will for taking yeah. a home loan, right? Work. Yeah, I, 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 uh, quantitative pe- people in, uh, yeah, we've been using that one for a while. It's quite good. Actually, I get quantitative people in, which is just growing the population, basically, yep. uh, through immigration is worse than quantitative easing. Um, so quantitative people, they're both about just juicing headline growth, right? Uh, not looking at, you know, actually raising productivity living standards, how much share of the economic pie everyone gets, um, uh, whether it raises inequality or not. Uh, both quantitative easing and quantitative peopling um, raises inequality, so it's good for the elites, bad for the you know ordinary Joe. Um, but I'd argue, I'd argue that quantitative peopling is worse because you obviously get um, the physical impacts on infrastructure, the environment, etc. Uh, so you know Australia lives in a pretty fragile uh, environment, and the hilarious thing is, only a couple of weeks ago, the State of the Environment report which gets released every five years. And they always say the same thing. Yep. But the latest one got released about uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe maybe three or four weeks ago. And it has a whole section on basically how the rapid growth in the capital cities is, you know, lowering living standards, is creating heat island effects, it's damaging native fauna, or it's straining the environment, um, all these sorts of things. And nobody mentions it. Like, I think, I think we... 
we we wrote on macro business. Well, I wrote on macro business a couple of times. Um, I did see someone in the conversation wrote it. Like one of the authors um, stuck their neck out. Uh, no, it's actually on news.com, I think. Uh, one of them, you know, wrote about it. But apart from that, you know, it's just skirted over. Like it's it's there in black and white. It's not rocket science when you look at impacts on the environment. So unfortunately, the, the Greens and the Teal Independents and all these people, they love to just talk about climate change all the time, right? So they talk about our emissions, our emissions, our emissions. But when you look at the impacts of, you know, big Australia, it goes way beyond emissions. It's it's the impact on the actual physical uh, physical natural environment that is more than just your emissions. Mm. Now, obviously, if you're going to grow the grow the number of people in Australia like a science experiment, as is pro- as is projected, well, you, Australia's never going to meet its forty three percent emission reduction targets. You can't do it when you're growing the population by one and a half percent every year. It's just not possible. Um, but that's not the, that's not the issue. That, that's not the big issue. The big issue is what happens to, you know, salinity, uh, land clearing, uh, all these other things that impact the environment a lot more um, than just looking at, you know, emissions. So uh, unfortunately, all that stuff just gets swept under the rug and everyone just talks about, you know, um, uh, carbon emissions, whereas they don't talk about all the stuff that's actually in the state of the environment report, which I'd argue is a lot, lot more important. So um, and then they, they do that because then they can say, oh, but Emissions are a global problem. It doesn't matter where people live. If they live in Australia, well, they're not they're not emitting carbon somewhere else. So it's a net net zero. But I'd argue, well, hang on, they're still coming. Like we we can only uh, we can only control what happens in our country. We can't control what the rest of the world does. So shouldn't we try and control control that? And obviously, if you're going to import, if you're going to double Australia's population, yeah, even if that was true, that didn't reduce global emissions. It's still going to damage our environment, which we should protect because we're custodians of Australia. Uh, but this sort of stuff just gets swept under the rug. And unfortunately, um, yeah, the, you know, the, the Australian Greens is a classic. They, I call them the fake Greens because up until the late 1990s, they were, they were for a stable population. And then unfortunately, once Pauline Hanson came around, they flipped and now they don't even talk about immigration. In fact, Nick McKinn, who's their immigration minister, is the biggest pro-mass immigration guy you'll ever, met, you'll, you'll ever see. He's an open borders guy. So, you know, if he got the reins, we'd probably have, who knows, half a million immigration every year. It'd be absolutely open slather. Uh, and, and they call themselves an environmental party. So, look, basically the whole, the big three are all fakes. Um, you've got a fake Labor Party, which doesn't represent the workers. You've got a fake Liberal Party that's not liberal at all. They're just, you know, scumbags who, who look after their business mates and do shady things. And you've got a fake Green Party. So, you know, unfortunately it's cynical, but uh, I think we're, I think politically we're stuffed. Be quite honest, and um, you know that's just the way it is, unfortunately. Um, sorry if you're watching home, and I've gone off a bit of a tangent. I didn't even plan to talk about this stuff, but here we are. <laughs> it's just a free throw, free, free flowing conversation. That's what we like. And uh, there's a couple of implications, right? Because if in fact we um, are looking at um, significant migration, and you know, some migration's good. I'm, I'm not saying yeah, we, should, oh, we shouldn't. We should, totally. it, shouldn't and, put and, a wall around the country and say no. nobody, but. The quantum of migration and the quality of the migration is pretty important, right? Yeah, totally. And, 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 and I'll, I'll just say that, you know, often people go, you, you, understand, you, you want to, like, it's always presented as this false binary choice mm. of zero or mega amounts. You've got to have it in between stage. And up until about 2004, we had a level that was, you know, wasn't extreme and suddenly it just shot up. And it's been like that ever since. Um, and, you know, it's like, well, <sighs> When people go, oh, you know, you're 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 just um, oh, you're just a xenophobe, or whatever. I go, I, I say to, them, well, was Australia xenophobic during the Sydney Olympics in 2000? You know, because everyone looks back on that and go, that was like a real peak at this country when we had the Sydney Olympics. It was great. Everyone's pride. There was, you know, Sydney was a good place to live. Melbourne was a great place to live. It wasn't too many. Well, there was a lot of people. But it wasn't nearly as packed as it is now. Mm. Um, you know, national pride was huge. Australia was like, you know, we'll we'll kick and butt and. Uh, back then, the immigration intake was like under 100,000. It's like, well, so during that year, were we xenophobic? What about the next year? Were we xenophobic that year? Because we had way less than now. And then um, so using that article, uh, using the argument, every year before 2005, we were xenophobic because we didn't have nearly as high immigration as we've, got, we've had in the last 15 years. Of course not. It's ridiculous. Um, nobody's saying, oh, we've got to take, you know, 
uh, people from certain countries exclude others or whatever. It's just about, you know, ha- what's the country's carry capacity? Um, how many can we take in and still ensure that, you know, hospitals don't get overcrowded, our cities don't become too big, we don't have crush loading on roads, rail infrastructure, we have adequate housing for everyone, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's basically um, immigration is what I call the everything issue because it, because it affects basically everything that affects quality of life. Um, yeah, not just immigration, population growth, I should say, but immigration obviously is a driver of that. So you want to basically make sure that everything is not running too hot so it doesn't damage all those quality of life indicators. And, you know, I think about 100,000 a year immigration is about right for Australia. Well, that's, that's pretty much what we had historically um, up until, you know, the mid-2000s. On average, it was about 100 grand, and that that'd be fine. And, you know, we could, we could manage that, we could absorb that uh, over time as, um, you know, deaths start, natural deaths start outnumbering births. The population would stabilise anyway, um, you know, after several decades. But unfortunately, you know, I think next year and beyond we're going to see 350,000, 400, 500, who, who the hell knows? Because it's the, the plan that the Albanese government has flagged is going to be a ginormous intake of immigration. Um, and that's going to have some, you know, huge implications for the economy, for living standards, interest rates, everything, which I don't know if you want to talk about that now or, um, you know, whatever we certainly can. Well, maybe we'll come back to you in a little bit. Let me just pick up this question from Cookie because it's sort of quite relevant. If I'm migrating to Australia, I've been near the bottom of the list, why everything is so expensive and the country is 20 years behind in investment. So that there is a global stage here in terms of competing for, you know, the best the best of the uh, available. And, and I guess the question is, are we actually competing on a level playing field or, as, as Cookie Boy suggests, are we a bit behind the eight ball here? Yeah, well, certainly he's definitely got a point if you were talking about, you know, coming from Denmark or Norway to Australia, or, you know, like a de- developed world, de- developed nation. But obviously most of our immigration is not from there. So people coming from poorer places, uh, whether it's, you know, Indian subcontinent, Nepal, et cetera, uh, through, this, through, through the student migration schemes, whatever. So for them, it's like, even though the quality of life here is in the last 15, 20 years has fallen from like a, maybe a nine out of 10 to a seven out of 10. If you come in from a three out of 10, that's still massively, that's a massive gain. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're not exactly a very attractive place if you're already in developed country, which has got great living standards. But if you're coming from somewhere, it's got bad living standards, well, we're still very attractive. Uh, so, you know, uh, there, there's no quantity of number Australia. Like Australia could have as big an immigration intake as it wanted if it wanted to lower standards enough. Um, and I mean, just let anyone in. Uh, it could be ginormous because, you know, I've got literally billions of people in other poorer nations who'd be willing to come here. Uh, well, sorry, not, not billions wouldn't come here, but there are, you know, nations with billions of people where, you know, a decent chunk of those people would want to come to Australia mm. uh, because the living standard difference is so high. Um, you know, we're just not going to get people from Norway, Denmark, Germany, you know, Europe, like anywhere in mainland Europe or whatever. We get, we get a few, but um, the majority of those people aren't going to come here because what would you? And I guess the other point here is that um, if you measure the success by global, and I mean global, Australian wide GDP, right, it's a bigger pie, as you said. But if you then divide it by the number of people, GDP per capita can usually go backwards. Yeah, or, that, or, 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 just, or just tread water. Yeah, and that's part of the problem, isn't it, in terms of if you're measuring it in a particular way, then it might look okay, but actually it's not really. No, no, that's right. And, and especially I'd argue for a country like Australia that's a – Massive energy exporter, and we can get. I, mean, I know you had Dave Dave Lowell Smith on you a few weeks ago, so we don't get nearly as much gains from our energy as we should. Like that's you know definitely we 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 don't capture the gains from that. But despite that, the fact of the matter is, Australia's number one well biggest export by a long mile is resources, whether it's iron ore, coal, gas. Even though it's not really an export because we actually cost us uh, for all the reasons Dave said the other week. Um, and the fact of the matter is, but if you're a country with ginormous mineral wealth, obviously it's like going to an inheritance. And if you, so imagine you went to inheritance, right? You go and, you, and your parents passed away and you and your brother or sister go in and they go, okay, they're worth, you know, five million bucks, you get two and a half each. It's like, oh, suddenly, no, no, no. We've actually got two long lost sisters who come, uh, you know, people who come in that, so now, now you're splitting that wealth between four people. 
that's effectively what you do when you've got a massive mineral base and you keep growing the population. You're spreading that mineral wealth over fewer people, which other things equal makes you poorer. And that's effectively what Australia does. Um, it's kind of stupid. Um, you know, Norway is a nation that has about five, less than five and a half million people. So it's less than size. It's about the size of Melbourne uh, and or Sydney. And it has a giant, you know, it actually taxes its resources properly. So it's oil and it's gas, and it's got a ginormous sovereign wealth fund. And nobody could argue that Norway would be wealthier if it had 10 million people because it would still be spreading that same amount of gas, that same mineral wealth. Their, their sovereign wealth fund's worth over $2 trillion spread over 5 million people. So it's enormous. If they had 10 million people, there's no way they'd be richer because you'd be spreading the same sovereign wealth, the so same sovereign wealth fund, over twice the number of people. It's just basic arithmetic. And, you know, we don't capture the wealth like we should, but the wealth that we do capture, if you spread it over more people, you, you get poorer. It's as simple as that. Um, it's not rocket science, but yet that's the economic model that Australia goes down. And, and you got to look at where, where do we put all the people that we bring in here? We put them in the people, service and jobs. They don't work in these great export industries because the export industries we've got, which are mostly minerals, are mostly done by machines. I mean, they have very, very little labour labor content. Um, so they go and work in cafes and restaurants like, you know, hospitality, um, you know, like all, all these people servicing industries that purely exist to service a bigger population. So it's kind of just this ridiculous system. And they actually end up being net drainers because ultimately a nation's exports pay for your imports. And if you keep putting people in these people servicing industries that don't earn any export income, but they still consume all the same imports as everyone else. Well, then you're going to run bigger trade, you know, bigger, um, you know, deficits and more debt over time. So, unfortunately, that that's Australia's economic model, and we'd be a lot richer. Like Australia'd be way richer if we had 20 million people than if we have, you know, about 26 million as we do currently. Now we had about 20 million at the turn of the century, or just under, and we'd be richer if we had 20 million now because for those, all those reasons I just said, we'd be we would have spread the entire mining boom over less people. And if we were smart enough to actually capture some of it, we'd be super rich, like the like like the people in Brunei. Um, you know, you think the people in Brunei would be richer if they had the five million people instead of you know five hundred thousand? No way, because mm. <laughs> they got this oil wealth which they share among a small population. If they if you increase the population, you got less wealth. It's not rocket science. Um, but yet, you know, nobody at the treasury or anyone actually thinks this way. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, so the whole concept of uh, getting bigger just for the sake of get it getting bigger, um, I mean, it's a bit like some of the uh, corporations who want to get bigger for the sake of getting bigger, but it doesn't well, actually mean that it's actually a good thing, right? But see, it does benefit, like that certainly benefits those corporations. So if you're mm. a, you know, if you're if you're a big property, big business, I'm not talking about big. It's like if you're a small small business, it doesn't mm. help you because mm. obviously if you have got a cafe, well, you get more people. There's more cafes open up and they compete against you. But if you're like a Coles or Woolies, or, you know, one of these oligopolies that we've got, and Australia is full of oligopolies, industries, well, they do benefit from bigger population. So I think of Jerry Harvey, you know, he's always pumping big migration. Um, why, you know, why wouldn't you? If you've got the population growing 1.5% every year, you can do nothing. And on average, your sales will grow by 1.5% every year. You've done nothing. To, you've, you're not, you're not um, competing harder. You're just making, making more bank. Um, and it's pretty much the same across, you know, all, all these sort of rent-seeking industries. We've got all these old couple of industries. They're the ones who love this stuff because having more workers to choose from obviously keeps wage pressures down. Um, we're seeing that at the moment, like, you know, whinging of labour shortages, et cetera, because we've had no immigration and mm. they're all whinging, they're going to have to pay more. Well, shock horror. Um, but, you know, if you flood the place with, uh, with, with migrant workers, it puts down pressure on wages. You also get more customers. And if you're in the property industry, well, you've got more people to sell homes to. Um, if you're a developer, your land bank goes up. It's just, you know, th this is the sort of model we've got. But unfortunately, these clowns um, run the government. And they don't look to say, oh, what do the voters actually want? Is it in their interest? It's all about, you know, what does high rise Harry want? Like high rise Harry, uh, Harry Triggerboff, you know, Meriton's, um, you know, billionaire, biggest apartment developer, uh, runs mostly out of Sydney. He's writing spruit pieces demanding immigration all the time in the Australian. Like, you get one a month off him. And, and, his, and his arguments are always the same. Oh, I've, most of my apartments in the last 20 years have been sold to, you know, Chinese students, for example. Um, 
it's made me heaps of money. We've got to have more of that uh, because it's good for me. It's not, you know, it's not whether it's good for all the people who have got to pay more and more and more for their for their shitty apartments that he sells. Um, that doesn't factor into the equation. It's all about, you know, what, what's good for high rise Harry? Like, how can he grow his, you know, I'm making this up, but $3 billion into $4 billion. Um, You know, it's never enough. So I'm sounding a bit like Dick Smith here, but, um, you know, the, the whole policy setting process is ridiculous. It's all based towards the oligarchs. And nobody is nobody represents the ordinary, you know, the, the ordinary Aussie who ends up getting a smaller house and paying more for it and having their amenity wrecked and having to compete harder for a job and um, spending more time crush loaded and, you know, living further away, spending more time in traffic, all these sorts of stuff, paying higher taxes through, you know, whether it's regular taxes or private taxes through toll roads. I call them, I still call them taxes. Um, you know, all that sort of stuff. Like uh, none of this factors into the minds of the politicians, unfortunately. Mm. And it should. Well, that's, <laughs> I think so. But it fundamentally, I suppose, det- is det- defined by, you know, what are governments there for? What's the economy there for? Is the economy just there to make um, bigger profits for the big the big guys? Um, and I'll just give you one other example. You know, the central bank digital currency thing announced last week. The RBA is teaming up with one of those um, um, sort of pseudo academic um, entities that gets a lot of funding from industry to figure out the commercial benefit of central bank digital currencies. But there was nothing there about consulting the consumers, getting input from the community as to how this flies. Right, it's all just driven by that same basic economic imperative. Yep. So it sounds like some backdoor deals been done. Yeah, uh, it's just yeah, that, that, that's policy making in Australia. Uh, you know, and and I know you had Dave on a few weeks ago talking about energy, but mm-hmm. um, what I'd love to see Labor do is obviously do reservation all that stuff that he talked about a few weeks ago, and we've talked about here in the past. But mm. what I'd love to see is if they do it, don't consult. Like the Queensland government gave the perfect. Um, they, they show how to, how to do this stuff. So in the last budget, they basically put in all these, uh, effectively a kind of super profits tax for coal. So they used to have a system where if coal price was, you know, under $100, $100 a tonne, they got this much royalty. If it was over 100 got X amount of royalty. Instead, they because the, the coal price went to $500, they did a whole bunch of sort of progressive tax um, steps. And, you know, basically it's going to raise them billions of dollars of revenue. It's very smart. Uh, but... They did it on the sly. They just announced it out of nowhere in the in the state budget. It was brilliant because it didn't. They didn't try and consult the industry. They didn't give the industry time to you know mount a scare campaign to get organised to then you know get their mates at uh, at um you know at, at the Australian and Mineral Council and all them involved to basically shut it down. They just got blindsided, and by the time they got their act together and actually started lobbying about it, it was a week later. And nobody cared. Uh, and that's how, if Labor's going to do the reservation thing, they should do it in the federal budget and don't say they're going to do it. Just do it because people will reward you for it and also you won't, you'll won't. you blindside the industry. Um, like it's a bit like in Survivor, you know, you get a tribal council, you think you're safe, and then suddenly someone snuffs out your flame, you're gone. <laughs> and, and, you know, Labor can do that. But if you tell the industry, oh, we're thinking about doing this, oh my God, you'll get exactly what happened during the mining tax uh, you know, in the under Ruddy era. Like they'll just shoot it down. They'll, they'll run a campaigns, ads on TV, you know, whatever. All this misinformation. So if they're going to do it, you blindside them. You just do what Queensland did because it works. Um, so you know, like you know, the reason why I mentioned that is you just mentioned consultation, and obviously, but for something like this, I don't want them to cons- consult. I just want them to do it and blindside the uh, you know the gas cartel, and actually get us some good policy. But you know, what's the chance of that actually happening? Probably five percent. And that's probably optimistic. <laughs> Indeed. Well, let's move the conversation on, Leith, because um, the other big conversation point is house prices, right? Oh, yeah. It's house prices point. have, well, is tanking too strong? I mean, I noticed your no. slide here, right? Mate, mate, they, they are tanking. There's yeah. no doubt about it. Look, look. Um, when I say they're tanking, I'm talking about the East. Well, Sydney and Melbourne are tanking. Brisbane's starting to tank. The um, the five city aggregates. So, these charts here are basically the core logic daily index, and that mm. measures the five major capitals. So it's got both Sydney, Melbourne, um, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, and then the five city aggregate is obviously the weighted average of those. 
And um, as you can see in that chart, Sydney's now down 6.3% uh, from its peak in mid-February and pretty much most of that, like 6% of that's happened since the RBA's first rate, rate cut. Uh, Melbourne's down just over 4%. Um, I thought it's pretty bad. I can't read that. Uh, whereas, um, whereas you know, the the five city aggregates down at about three and a half percent. Brisbane's only fall, started falling since mid June. That's better. Sorry, my eyes aren't that good. I should really need to get glasses. <laughs> um, and Brisbane's only down about one point nine percent, but that only started falling uh, mid June. Um, so you can see that it's starting to roll, and it's been led by Sydney and Melbourne. Now it's spread to Brisbane, Adelaide, and Perth. Is still uh, the rate of growth is falling. I got. A, Article coming out about that tomorrow in Macro Business. Um, the rate of growth there is falling quite sharply, but it's still positive. And you can see on the right chart there, I've done the quarterly uh, price growth. And you can see that basically Brisbane started, it was already trending down, but it started falling a lot faster after the RBA's first rate, rate, rate hike. And Sydney, Melbourne, the five city aggregates, you know, firmly negative and they're still falling. So uh, the rate of growth still, the rate of price decline is still rising. Um, so yeah, look, it's it, it, it's definitely a past the popcorn moment if you live in Sydney or Melbourne, uh, and Brisbane's starting to Brisbane had a massive forty percent run up in prices over yeah. the pandemic, so they're so they're due. Um, and, and that's one of the points that people keep making to me as well. You know, it's coming back a bit, but it's still way higher than where it was before COVID. Oh yeah, right? totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh look, totally. It's got miles to look. It'd have to fall. Geez, I don't know what twenty. 20% or something to even take us back to the pre-COVID level nationally. Yep. Cause I think they went up at 25, yep. uh, no 30%, I think uh, nationally, but well, it depends what index you use. But the, um, but obviously, you know, if, if a price go, if a house goes up hundred percent, only has to fall 50 to get back to where it was. Mm. That's just the way it works. So yep. the falls, um, you know, do more damage than the rises uh, cause you're falling from a high level. Mm. Um, but yeah, look, it, it certainly is. It is tanking, uh, and it's only a matter of time. If, if, if the RBA keeps hiking, and if you believe the financial markets, or Westpac or ANZ, so Westpac and ANZ have basically tipped the cash rate to peak at about three point two five percent mid uh, early next year, whereas the financial markets are tipping about three point seven percent by May. So we're currently at one point eight five. So if you get either of those scenarios, it means that the RBA is only about halfway through its tightening cycle. And what basically has happened in the last, um, you know, four months or so is going to happen again at about the same pace. Mm. And if the market's right, it's going to happen even more aggressively. They're going to get, you know, another, they're going to get even more hikes. So what this would basically mean, so I've got a chart here. Um, the one on the far left is the um, is the market's latest interest rate uh implied yield so it's basically the latest projection and, and that gets updated daily so i don't know if the one for 16th of august i.e today has been uploaded yet uh, i pulled that down at about three o'clock today but there it tips about 3.7 percent by may and the chart on the right basically extrapolates that so if you assume that the any rise in the official cash rate gets passed on the discount variable mortgage rate um which is, seems like a pretty good assumption um, that's that would lift the discount variable mortgage rate seven point zero five percent by May, and that's against what three point four five percent in April this year before the first rate hike. So it's a more than doubling uh, in about thirteen months. And the table at the bottom basically shows you. So what I've done is I've got three loan sizes: fifty thousand, seven hundred fifty thousand, a million dollars. I've got out a mortgage calculator and put out what the monthly repayments are on a thirty-year principal interest variable mortgage. Um, at 3.45%, which was its level just before the first rate hike, versus 7.05%, which is basically the market's prediction by May. And you can see that average principal interest mortgage repayments would rise by 50% if the market's you know, interest rate forecast comes through. So in 13 months, basically, you'd have a 50% increase in, more, in uh, mortgage repayments. And what that means in dollar terms is if you got a $500,000 mortgage, you'd be looking at paying an extra $1,100 a month um, and if you've got seven hundred fifty thousand dollars mortgage, it's about one one thousand seven hundred a month. And obviously, you know, a million dollar mortgage is double the five hundred thousand, so that's twenty two hundred dollars a month. So we're looking at you know massive, massive increases in uh, mortgage repayments, and effectively, the discount variable mortgage rate would be at its highest level since two thousand eleven. So you've got to go back, um, you know, eleven years to basically, or by that stage, twelve years to have seen those sorts of mortgage rates. 
Now, you know, people often say, oh, yeah, but it was higher, but you know, it's higher in 2008, whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But the level of household debt was nearly as high. And obviously, um, you know, if anyone had bought recently, that would be a massive, massive burden. Um, yeah, there's a rule of thumb, isn't there? Every 1% of mortgage rate is roughly a 15% increase in the monthly repayment on a typical 30-year mortgage. That's, that's Yeah, yeah. Thumb, oh, right? I, think, actually, I think it might be 12%, but yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a lot. It, so, it's, so, it's a lot, yeah. And, and what that also means, though, is the reverse of that means that borrowing capacity uh, yeah. gets, gets reduced by that amount. So yeah. effectively, you know, if you subscribe to the, which I don't know how you can't, but the view that, um, you know, it's basically because most houses are purchased with a mortgage, right? It's uh, it's it, it's it's mortgage credit that basically sets the house price in yep. a lot of respects. So so obviously every one percent rise in the um, in mortgage rates, if that equates to you know eleven or twelve percent reduction in borrowing capacity, well, that's going to reduce house prices. It has to. Um, so in that situation, if if, if mortgage rates do go up to seven point zero five percent, other things equal. This is what economists like to say. Other, you know, hold everything else equal. Um, you were to get a 50% reduction in borrowing capacity. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that prices go down 50% because people don't always spend to the maximum limit. But, um, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that it's going to have a pretty big impact on house prices because, you know, suddenly someone who could afford, uh, you know, if you could afford a million-dollar mortgage, well, suddenly after that you can only afford, um, like the money give out, I don't know, I should be able to do the math in my head, but I can't. Um, you know, you might only be able to afford like 700000 or something. So yeah. the the your bid price falls because the banks won't lend you as much because you get basically re repriced. So that that's kind of the argument Chris Joy has been making when he made like Chris Joy to debate with the kook, smashed him, and um, you know the kook was trying to say, oh, you know, it, the, the kook was basically predicting that the cash rate is going to go to three percent, so you're going to have a mortgage rate of about uh, what's that, six point seven percent, but we're only going to seven seven percent peak to trough falling house prices. Like, well, how's that possible when Borrowing capacity is going to fall by about forty percent under that scenario. It's just I, I can't see how that's even possible. Um, so anyway, look, it's I don't know what's going to happen. Um, the 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 market is crazy, um, but you know it's been right to this point. So who the hell knows? Um, <laughs> what you, you know, what's your call in terms of where you think oh, it might get? Shit, to? Mate. Like, like, honestly, before they started this, well, when they when they did the first point two five. Mm. I thought, oh, look, you know, they shouldn't go above 1% rate rise because that, that's all they need to do. But then I was like, nah, but that's, you know, whatever. Then I, then I thought, oh, maybe one and a half. And then it's just been like creeping up. They've already smashed through that. Um, like, you know, it, it gets down to what do you think they should do versus what do you think they will do? Mm. Um, I think the most sensible bank commentator on this has been Gareth Ed at CBA. So Gareth Ed initially was tipping 1.35, I think, was his peak. This was at the start. Because that that that's a level he thought was enough to get you away from zero to be um, he, he thought that'd be contractionary enough, but like a little bit contractionary, but not too contractionary. Um, but then obviously he's ramped that up because the RBA keeps rising. Now he's he's now tipping like a two point six percent, but he thinks that the two point six percent peak cash rate still is way too aggressive, and that they'll they'll be forced to cut, you know, by mid next year anyway. Um, I think he's probably right, but look, who knows, mate? Like the um, you know, trying trying to pick what the RBA is going to do is just like doing this. Well, you know, no back back last October they said no, no move until twenty twenty four, right? And Mate, then, they're, they're pretty much saying that in March. Yeah. Like I, I, I pulled up a, um, I've written a few posts saying what they were saying in March. Is yep. they go, oh, we're going to be patient, we're going to wait mm. till wages grow above three yep. percent. They were still saying that stuff. Yep. And then April they sort of turned. It's like, oh shit, they're going to turn now. And then <laughs> and then they, then they then they totally turned. And so the, it's just like, yeah. the point I'd make is that they certainly, to my mind, get heavily influenced by what the Fed is signalling, right? Yep. And yep. I actually and, don't, and, I don't and, think, and, and, go on. So, sorry, no, no, also I think they just seem to be following whatever the financial markets are saying yep. too, So, which I yep. guess is based on that as well. So. Yep. Yeah. It's yeah. Just so, so rates are going up higher, prices are going to c come down further. Yeah, and... And how far? Who knows? Like it all, it all depends what the RBA does. Yep. Um, like people, go, oh, what's your tip? It's like I don't know. Well, it depends what the RBA does. Like mm -hmm. if if the RBA's own modelling says that a two hundred, this is the one they did in the financial stability review, said that a two hundred basis point increase in um, in mortgage rates would reduce real house prices. So this is another problem because we've got high inflation at the moment. 
but uh, real house prices by 15%. So if you get, you know, a 3.6% uh, increase in the cash rate as the um, markets have tipped, well, then you're going to get almost a, well, according to that, it's going to be like a 25% plus real in, real fall in house prices according to the RBA's own modelling. Um, now, obviously, with inflation, you know, fairly high at the moment, 25% real might be, I don't know, 18% nominal. Uh, sorry, is that right? Hang on. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. 18% normal. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, but who knows? Like, it depends. It, what, what it does tell you, though, even the RBA's modelling says that you get pretty big mm. interest rate. Uh, yep. Sorry, pretty big house price falls. So, so it does absolutely reinforce the connection between credit availability and house prices, right? Oh, yeah, totally. Which is weird, of course, because both the RBA and APRA say house prices, nothing to do with us. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, the, the funny thing is, um, you, you probably know more about this than me, mm. uh, but the haven't they just increased the repayment buffer as well, back to 3%? Yeah, it's 3%. Yeah, that was done yeah, a few yeah, months ago. Went, yeah. yeah, and it went, it went down to 25 was wasn't it? Yeah, uh, so, so basically they, they took away the, the, the ceiling and then took it down yeah. to two and a half and then they put it back up to three. Yeah, yeah. so, so yeah. That, that's just going to constrain credit even more. So, so like, if the simple mortgage rate rise of one basis point, sorry, 100 basis points, 1%, mm. uh, reduces um, borrowing capacity by I don't know, 12%, I think it is, um, well, then they've also increased that repayment buffer, which mm. then reduces um, you know borrowing capacity even further, other things equal, because banks have basically got to assume that the – that they can repay a rate that's three percent above what it is. Mm. Uh, so you know, if you get a ten, seven percent mortgage rates, well, then they got to assume ten percent. Is that right? So a, a ten percent mortgage rate. Um, well, it's meant to be three percent above the actual mortgage rate that's yeah, um, so be negotiated. 10, so it should be ten percent. Yeah. Yeah, which which you know, so you're going from <laughs> two and a half percent on three point four five if you use a discount variable mortgage rate, and yeah. then obviously fixed rates were they went down at two percent. Yep. So. So you know, it'd be the most interesting thing would be is when the half a million dollars, I think CBA said uh, half a billion, sorry, half a billion, yeah. half a million, half a billion dollars worth of fixed rate mortgages yep. roll over. Uh, so Gareth, there at CBA, basically using the CBA's loan book, he extrapolated that there's about half a billion dollars worth of mortgages um, that are due to expire, I think, by the end of next year. Uh, so. You know, and obviously part of that will happen this year because um, part of it will happen next year. Some people took out one year fixed rate mortgages. Some people took out two years, whatever. But those people who got in at about 2% uh, mortgage rate are going to be facing um, a gigantic increase in mm. repayments. Well, they could be going from 2% to 6% plus or if the market's right, you know, maybe 7 who knows. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a massive rate shock from it. It's a bit like those adjustable rate mortgage um, not adjustable rate mortgages, the, the teaser mortgages that the yeah, well, adjustable, the adjustable, adjustable rate loans were exactly the problem in the US. Yeah. And I've, I've said to a few um, uh, media people over the last couple of weeks, this is our version of it, right? Because it's yeah. precisely well, 40%, the same. Yeah, it's a huge. 40% of mortgages were, 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 were fixed rate. Correct. Yeah. So this, this is a big deal. Yeah. 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 So, now, so look, look, for me, who writes in this stuff every day, it's great. I've got to say, like, yeah, look, I mean, look, I've got to say, I, I own a house, got a mortgage like everyone else, but, or like most other people, well, um, but I don't care. It's just fun. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's just like a daily, daily pantomime. So bring it on. So this is what to the um, RBA, yeah, this is, a, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they were showing the percentage change for yep. the fixed rate loans. And, you know, 40 to 6%, 6% plus percentage change is what they're looking at, right? And there's a bit of a distribution there in terms of, of over the timing of it. Um, it's a big chunk and it's coming quite quick. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, yeah, CBA's data, $500 billion worth of mortgages by yep. in the next year. And yep. when, when, when Gareth Head first did that, it was about six months ago, I think. Mm. So, um, you know, we're already six months in. So <laughs> it's just funny because th these things, when, when, when they get written, you go, oh, it's still a while away, you know, whatever. But then suddenly, um, as as you no doubt know, and anyone who's a bit older, um, time time speeds up the older you get. So That's it's true. like it'll be here before you know it. Yeah. And uh, yep, yep. yeah. So so here's my question: two hundred and fifty billion buffers, right? Is the number that was trotted out by Friedenberg before the election, well before the election? Um, the RBA governor has been quoting it for quite some time. Um, so how does the two hundred and fifty billion buffers play into this? whole scenario 
Well, I guess it all comes down to who 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 has it. Um, you know, the third of people, about a third of people have mortgages in Australia. So you look at it, you know, a third of people are the ones who are sensitive to these interest rate rises. And of those, the ones who took out mortgages in you know, the last couple of years are the most sensitive. And they're, they're, and they're facing the biggest problem. Are those who sort of borrowed big to get in the market where there was fear of missing out, et cetera. And I can bet you bottom dollar, those people wouldn't have big buffers. Um, they wouldn't have big savings buffers. It's more likely to be the people who aren't in trouble anyway or you know own the houses. They might own them outright, but they have very little mortgage debt. They bought them years ago. They're... Um, you know they they got they got higher paying jobs etc. So, but but those people are never the problem when it comes to these sorts of you yep. know analysis. It's always yeah it's 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 a margin borrower. Yep. So it's so it's the it's the it's the people that you know really it's it's really the the more recent buyers who are the biggest problem. Yep. It's not someone like me who bought my house in twenty thirteen. Um, you know yeah a bit of an interest rate rise is you know slightly annoying, but it's not it's not going to like I've already paid down a lot of the house of you know. I'm a bit of, as I said last time, I'm a tight wad shop at Aldi, all that sort of stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty well prepared for this. <laughs> but um, you know, but but if I if, if this was you know Leith back in 2013, like I bought in 2013, and you know I faced a doubling of mortgage rates in 2014, well then it'd be a different story. Um, even though I didn't, I bought during a downswing. I didn't buy at the top at a peak of a cycle. But you know, regardless, if, if my interest rates only doubled on what I purchased in 2013, well then I'd be in a lot more pain. Um, so that you know, it's the more recent buyers that are the ones who are, you know who, who you got to worry about, and they tend to be also younger or you know um, the you know younger recent entrants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, yeah, it's uh, pass the popcorn, mate. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, and I do quite a lot of modelling on this, of course, in my surveys, and uh, my observation is around forty percent of people with a mortgage have no buffers at all. Yeah, I, they're actually, just I, about hanging on, right? There's another group at the other end who've got a lot of buffers and they've paid a lot down, and there are some people in the middle sliding more towards the problematic end of the spectrum as, as rates are rising. Because you've got to overlay the inflation question, cost of gas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all those other things in there, and the fact that real wages are still going backwards. I wish huh? I'd... Um, now, now that you said that with your 40% figure, mm. um, I've actually got two charts from... Westpac, I think, and CBA. Mm. So they're like two of our biggest lenders. Yep. If you add them together, they're probably, I don't know, 40, 50% of mortgage lending. Yep. Um, from their annual reports, and they show what how much buffers the mortgage borrowers have. And by memory, it's about in their books, it's about 40% don't have any yeah. buffer. Westpac's about 40, CBA slightly lower, I think. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but either way, it, do, it does. It's, um, it's a big number. Yeah. And, yep. and, and, and it also had those with, uh, I think it had by memory, I'm going, this wrote this about a month or so ago. Um, they had something on uh, by debt to income ratio as well. Yes, correct. Yeah, so it's obviously the ones with high debt, debt yep. to income ratio have got the least buffers. Yep, exactly. So uh, and, and that you know so that, so there's like a there's a real big chunk who weren't actually who weren't ahead of their mortgage repayments at all. Yep. And there was a massive amount that were like only you know a couple months ahead. Correct. So this whole notion that there's this big buffer out there, it might be true in aggregate across the economy. Yeah. But I can guarantee you that. The majority of that, the overwhelming majority of that, will be people that own mortgages anyway, or have very small mortgages bought years right. ago, uh, who aren't at risk anyway. Well, on the point, a lot of that buffer, so again, my modelling is not actually connected to the mortgage sector at all. Yeah, that oh, two hundred and fifty no. buffers sitting in a lot of people with no mortgages. Yeah, right. Totally. It, it, it'd be it'd be the uh, and, and as we said, about two thirds of people that own mortgages. Yeah. So exactly, they're either be, renting uh, or they're actually uh, own, own, owning free. Although, of course, yeah. the the proportion of owning free has dropped and the proportion of renting are going up and the proportion with mortgages are bigger than ever. But nevertheless, the fact is that we've got a lot of people who have no mortgage and therefore have no risk. The problem yeah. I've got with these big numbers that they keep trotting out is trying to reassure everybody is it's completely meaningless, right? Well, Shane Oliver put a – he said something pretty funny in um, a recent thing. He, I think it was with regards to that. He goes, well, yeah, it's like having one – one hand in the freezer and the other one in the oven. <laughs> yes. um, like, yeah, yeah. on average, you might be fine. Yes. But it's the one in the oven who's, you know, it's, it's your hand in the oven that's going to get burnt. Yep. And, and and get destroyed. So it's like, you know, it's a problem with using using averages So there was and, a, and, and aggregates. I've told this joke before, but I said, uh, there was a guy, very senior guy at APRA who told me this some time ago as another way of saying it. He said, imagine that you're actually trying to shoot a duck, right? And you shoot ahead of the duck 
and you shoot behind the duck and the economist says, well, on average, the duck's dead. <laughs> yep, that sounds about, that sounds like economics. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's a shoddy so, industry, mate. It's yeah. a shoddy, shoddy uh, profession. Well, somebody's got to do it. Now, let's go on to yeah. rentals then, right? Because the rental oh, yeah. stuff, I mean, one of the things that people haven't understood is many property investors are seeing their interest rates rise. So their first reaction is, shit, I need to actually increase my rents. And we're seeing very significant rent rises. And it's interesting that the official figures in the CPI are much lower than the real figures that we're actually seeing in the market. Mate, they are so far out of whack. I've never seen all of this before. Mm. So, uh, have you got that chart? Yep. Um, yeah, this is a this is a cracker. So, this is basically CoreLogic's uh, snapshot of the rental market. I pulled out a report I got today. It's going up tomorrow in Macro Business. And what it basically shows is that um, you know the rental vacancy rate is at its lowest level on record, and you know one point two percent across um, across the nation slightly less in the regions, marginally more in the capital cities. Um, and, and annual rental growth, I don't know why the chart on the right doesn't match the table on the left because I've got them both from their July packs. But anyway, um, annual rental growth is running at nearly double-digit pace. So it's 9.5%, the table on the left, 9.8, the one on the right. But either way, it's it's highest it's been in decades. So we've effectively got this you know record-tight rental market where rents are absolutely rocketing. And you know really. When you talk about the housing market, it's really renters who are the biggest, um, the ones who are suffering the most. Like we talk about interest rates a lot, but it's really the renters I feel sorry for the most. Uh, and they 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 don't get much air, air time because you know they're renters, um, unfortunately. So they they tend to get forgotten. But the hilarious thing about it is we've got this you know extreme rental price inflation, but uh, which all the da private data providers, whether it's CoreLogic, Domain, SQM Research. They're all saying the same thing, that rents are going through the roof. Yet the official um, ABS, ABS rent uh, CPI rents, which they use as part of their CPI calculation, is actually running at about a quarter the rate of inflation. Uh, there's a chart there, Martin, if you, I think it's on the next slide. Yep. Um, yep. There you go. Yeah, there we go. So, so, so this is the actual official rental growth, according to the, the ABS. Now, You'll notice there it is picking up, but as of the year to June, it rose by only 1.6% according to the, uh, the the ABS, which is one quarter of the rate of the headline inflation. So according to the, according to the ABS, rents are actually disinflationary and they're lowering the inflation rate, whereas the market um, rental measures are saying it's close to double digits. Now, the reason for this disconnect is that the market measures of rent, they measure advertised rents. So that's basically new rents, new rentals that are that are basically uh, taking place now, um, new rental properties. So that affects basically, uh, so that's like a flow of rents, whereas the APS, a ABS, not APS, ABS mentioned, uh, measures total rents across the entire market. So not just new rents, but also existing rents. And obviously the existing rents figures a lot higher, you know, a lot, lot more in number than the new rents. But over time, the ABS's fidget figure should trail the market figure because the flow of um, the flow of uh, obviously these extraordinarily high rents rental growth is going to then uh, over time uh, be the rents in the market. So what what it's basically telling us is that the CPI rents are going to boom over the next year or so as they catch up to the market the market measures. And what the and the rental market that rents comprises six percent of the CPI, just over six percent. So, effectively, this is going to be another one of these uh, inflationary shocks that's going to hit the economy next year, uh, alongside energy. Yep. Um, so, you know, I've argued that most of the most of the inflation that we've had to date has been imported or weather related through oil prices, etc. Um, you know, imported goods, chip shortages, um, lettuces when you know it comes to floods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we're starting to get these sort of second round things where because the Albanese government is hopeless and won't reserve our gas, we're going to get a massive energy shock, uh, both, you know, gas prices and electricity, which is about probably five to 6% of the CPI. And then we're also going to have this rental market shock as well, yep. uh, where, where inflation is going to surge on the back of rising rents, which isn't captured yet at the moment, as I said, it's disinflationary because it's not being measured right or it's, it's laggy um, and that's going to catch up. And then overlay the other 
factor which we touched on earlier on but let's come back to it now migration right because where do migrants go when they first come into the country they rent and you know it, yeah so th this is this is the crazy thing so basically the albanese government came out in the weekend they said they're going to ramp up the permanent migrant intake to seven to two hundred thousand people next year so they use use this jobs and skills uh, summit slash trojan horse to get a fake consensus to lift immigration. And they're gonna ramp up the permanent migrant intake to 200,000 uh, from 160,000 currently. So it's a 40,000 increase. But even a bigger impact in the short term is that they're vowed to speed up the processing of circa 570,000 temporary visa applications that are currently outstanding. So, so we've got 570,000 temporaries who are waiting to get approved alongside 200,000 permanents, uh, you know, increase of 40,000. Um, now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know what that equates to. Uh, basically, next year, we're going to have an absolutely ginormous increase in immigration if these plans come to fruition. Um, now, the, the temporaries, we did lose about half a million temporaries over the pandemic, so this is them coming back. But, you know, you, you're, you're looking at a ginormous increase in immigration and population growth. And, it's, and, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that this is probably going to uh, ramp up immigration to its highest ever level. Now, immigration peaked at 315,000 in 2008 under Big Australia, Kevin Rudd. Remember he said, I'm a, I'm a supporter of Big Australia. Well, you know, good old Albo Labor is going to totally smash that. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if who knows how big it can go. Like if they get all, get all these temporaries back and they get the they ramp up the permanent intake, we could have, who knows, half a million? I don't know. But... The big question is, we've got the lowest rental vacancies on record, 1% across the regions, 1.3% across the capital cities. We've got nearly double digit rental growth. Where the hell is, you know, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 new, you know, new bodies coming into Australia that need accommodation going to live? Um, and what the hell is it going to do in the rental market? Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. We're going to, uh, rental vacancies are going to crash even more. Rents are going to surge. I'm going to have a hell of a lot of homelessness because that's basically the outcome of ramping up, you know, big Australia immigration to levels we've never seen before. And the, the, the problem with it is at the start of the pandemic, I tipped that the rental market, you know, we'd have a massive rise in vacancies. And I was wrong because who would have foresaw that uh, rental vacancies would actually fall amid basically flat population growth because work from home came into effect and suddenly people demanded more space. They need home offices, et cetera, et cetera. And the census figures actually show that the number of people living in group homes has shrunk quite mm -hmm. considerably. Yep. So effectively, the number of people per dwelling has shrunk over the pandemic because everyone's needed more space for their home offices, et cetera. And unless that, that trend quickly reverses to accommodate all these migrants coming in, you're going to, the, the logical conclusion is you're going to have an even worse shortages of rental accommodation. It's just, you, you can't gloss over the fact. It's not you know, possible to come to any other conclusion unless mm -hmm. that pre, that, that pandemic, um, you know, work from home effect reverses quickly. Uh, you know, the rental market's going to get absolutely destroyed and rents are going to balloon and that's going to put up a pressure on inflation. So, you know, a, a lot of common economists have said, Oh, we've got a ramp of immigration to tame wage pressures, so we can because wage growth obviously factors into inflation. But they're not looking at the other side. Well, it's going to ramp up. Um, it's going to you know it's going to ramp up rental prices, obviously, yeah. and that that feeds inflation, and it's yeah. going to probably it's going to put more pressure on energy the energy market, which is constrained because there are more users, and that's going to put up push up energy prices, other things equal. So, you know, the, it's, it's a disaster in the making. It's particularly bad for renters who are going to get their income smashed through lower wage growth. And then also have their cost of living rise because they've got to compete harder for accommodation. So it's, you know, we're, we're looking at a potential inequality disaster here. And unfortunately, every economist in the country, bar me, is going to gloss over it and not even care because, well, there's you know. Two other factors. The first is we've got a million plus empty properties across Australia based on the census, right? Yep. So there's a lot of people sitting on empty property. And the yeah, other and is. One of those would be Airbnbs. Spot on. For sure. Yeah, was, you, 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 exactly. So I was going to say precisely that. So one of the things that happened as people went into COVID was they actually switched from Airbnb into longer-term rentals. 
and now they're actually kicking people out so they can yeah. do Airbnb. Right? The tourism, the whole tourism market's kicked back off. Correct. So that that's yeah. the that's a factor that needs to be thought about. The the other one, which is sort of, you know, in the in the picture too, is that the momentum in terms of rent rises is there but many property investors have concluded that they've got a big run up in capital value because of probably run up over the last 18 months to two years they're seeing the capital value begin to turn back so what they're doing is listing yep. their properties to sell them and that's one of the reasons why property listings have gone up dramatically in recent times so again in my research quite a few of those are actually ex-investment properties so the stock of investment properties is shrinking just at the time when we've got this crisis. Yeah, and obviously, look, usually usually I'd argue uh, it doesn't matter because if an investment property becomes owned or occupied, you lose a rental property, but you have one less renter. But the problem with it is while they're on the market, they're vacant. Yep. So, um, you know, that, so you've got this friction going on. Um, so, yeah, look, that, that, that's an issue. And, and I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that, um, you know, I would have thought that rising interest rates for investors wouldn't be so bad. I mean, obviously, you've got to pay more of your mortgage and that sucks. But at the same time, with rental growth so strong, um, any rise in rents, you get tax deductible on because of negative gearing. At the same time, your rents your rents are rocketing as well. So I would have thought that investors are actually reasonably well protected from this rising interest rate environment. It's really own occupiers that are going to get smashed more than anything, um, purely because investors have got a tax deduction on your you know mortgage cost to be your rental income surging so nearly 10 percent on average across australia so well but you've just that, you just hit, hit a very critical point and that is we we the taxpayer will be subsidizing oh, property investors mate. to a much bigger tune now because of course they're getting higher interest that they can offset yeah and you know the worst thing about it um, we're not going to see the data on it for two years. No, I know. Because the, uh, the the ATO tax statistics, I've actually stopped looking at them. Like it's, um, I used to report them every year, but they're so lagged. They're like yep. two years behind. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, it's almost, in, in, in this environment, it's almost pointless to look at them because I'm looking at, you know, years ago when the rates were falling. And, the, and then it's not till next year we're going to get the, the trough of last year. So we're not going to see the impact of this for probably three years' time. We're going to see the full impact of it. Yep. Uh, on how much it is actually costing the taxpayer, but it's going to be huge because um, obviously, you know, if you double mortgage rates, if the market's right, I mean, who knows they're right? But uh, you know, it, let, let's just say mortgage rates double, we're going to get a massive, you know, increase in cap in uh, negative gearing deductions, which means it's you know it's going to be uh, subsidised by you and me. So uh, yeah, welcome to Australia. How good is Australia? To yeah. quote somebody, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I know. Good old Australia. We we, we, so, we give our we give our gas away for free. Um, you know, actually we end up paying more for it for yeah. gas that we own, give it away. Well, for and free then the and, profits you know, go back overseas, right? Yeah, we get nothing for it. Yeah. So it's you know, just another another free kick for the capitalist class. <laughs> so is there any surprise then that consumer confidence is at recessionary levels? That's the obvious next question, isn't it? No, well, so th th this is a this is a classic chart updated today. The latest Roy Morgan figures. So, basically, um, yeah, I've just plotted the Roy Morgan Consumer Confidence Index. Now it's released weekly, but you average out each month to give you a monthly figure. Um, back all the way back to pretty much its, 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 its inception in the late eighties, and you know, outside the pandemic, um, that brief little dip and dip during the pandemic at the start of the lockdowns. Um, consumer confidence is tracking its lowest level since the early 90s recession. So, um, you know, well below the GFC there. The GFC is shown in 2007 and 8, you can see. Uh, so basically, um, you know, confidence is already at or near recessionary levels. And the interesting thing about it is the RBA has never commenced a rate tightening cycle with consumer confidence already at such poor levels. Now, I wish I'd put this in here. I just forgot. But um, so I just thought of it right now. The CBA did a fantastic chart uh, tracking um, it's Westpac's consumer sentiment index, which is basically the same. It's just a monthly version. They track almost perfectly against uh, um, household consumption. Mm. And it shows that basically household confidence leads household consumption at a really high correlation. Now, the reason why that's important is that uh, I mentioned last time I was on here, Household consumption is the biggest driver of the economy by far. So that accounts for about 55% of, of Australia's growth on record on, on average. 
So obviously, if if consumer confidence is bombed, and it you know almost perfectly or very strongly correlates with household consumption, and um, it should tell you that household consumption is about to tank. Uh, and 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 if that happens, that obviously means that we're going to have a big smash. Uh, economic growth is going to get snapped, smashed because household consumption is the key driver of economic growth. So um, you know the the latest retail sales figures at the moment have weakened a bit. Um, discretionary stuff, but that's only back to about June, so it's you know yep. it's very lagged. Um, CBA's own internal data, so like I'm friends with Gareth there at CBA, and he um, the, the head of Australian economics, and he's a really smart guy. If you want to get get someone good on the show, like a good economist, get him on there. He's awesome. Um, so he uh, when, when he took over his role, he basically got CBA to uh, develop basically shadow data series that mirror the ABS, but are way more frequent than the, than the ABS. And they've actually got a better sample than the ABS because they've got about 25% of the nation's bank accounts. And they obviously, you know, screen, it's all it's all metadata, so no, nobody's privacy is hacked or anything. But um, what what their retail sale, the CBO retail sales figure or household consumption um, spending data is showing, and that's current to now, is that discretionary uh, spending is, is now falling, which is... Makes sense mm. um, in response to rate hikes and obviously cost of living pressures. So, and I'll tell you something because in my data, I actually map spending to mortgage stress. Yep. And you can assume, as is completely true, that those who are stressed are actually spending a lot less than those who are not stressed, right? And those without a mortgage are spending a lot more than those with a mortgage. So there's this weird non equal distribution across households and cohorts. Yeah, and, and, and the Australian Retail Association today just came out with a survey saying that the Father's Day, projected Father's Day spends down about 8% on or 7.5% on last year. Yep. Um, and it all gets down to cost of living concerns and obviously households being squeezed by you know rising mortgage rates. So, yeah, it all makes sense. I mean, obviously, if you've got a third of households who have seen their mortgage repayments already lift quite substantially, um, no, well, not a third because some are fixed, but, you know, even 25%, so. Mm. Um, it's going to obviously, you know, it, um, I know my place or whatever, you know, if you're paying hundreds of dollars extra a month on your mortgage, well, that's under hundreds of dollars less you can spend on other stuff and you're going to cut back on the stuff you don't need. So, this, you know, non, uh, the, sorry, discretionary spending is always going to get hammered. Yep. Um, I think I said non-discretionary before when I was talking, but anyway, I meant discretionary, sorry mm. for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're... Um, obviously, your non-discretionary spending, which I think I said before, which I meant, which I was wrong, and reverse that around, uh, is your food and your stuff you have to spend. Yep, which is uh, which has an energy. inflation rate much higher than the yeah than that's the right. average, right? Yeah, yes, but your discretionary spending is the stuff that you don't have to buy. Yep. Like you know, you, you don't have to go go out and buy a coffee down the street. You can mm. make one at home. You can mm. you know, um, and, and and that's the stuff that's going to get smashed. So yeah, I love to see Harvey Norman uh, Harvey Norman sales in a year. It'd be quite interesting. Jerry Harvey would be winged, you know that. And, and I don't know whether you saw this. I, I, Cookie Boy sent me this a little while ago. This is actually grocery inflation in the Illawarra a few months ago, right? And they were actually up 20%, right? So these are stat- Audi. Yeah. Audi, good thing. <laughs> uh, Audi's better than some of the others, but, you know, the, the, they're, they're big they're big increases. And that's the point that what I'm seeing in my data is that a lot of the households who are struggling are particularly struggling on the every, on the everyday necessities, right? And they're having to give up things and trade off, you know, things like dental treatment versus buying food and those sorts of things. Oh, I mean, totally. a, a, a quick a quick tip for anyone, though, if you want to avoid that, buy avocados. They're cheap. Uh, I've, got a, I've got an oversupply of avocados. So I've been smashing those big time. But the, um, <laughs> wasn't, but, but no, wasn't it the 100%. smash avocados that were meant to be the symbol of, uh, you know, excess earlier on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, if you go to a cafe and you buy a smashed avo, look, I, I, I'm such a cheapskate. I never go to cafes. I never buy my coffee out. I get Coles Express if I ever go out. It's a dollar. Mm. Um, I just refuse because I just think it's a ripoff. I can make it at home. That's just, yeah, I'm one of those guys. But the, um, you know, a bit of a curmudgeon. But the, um, you know, the what, what, what you say is 100%. Like I did, I did my Audi shop last night after gym and, you know, I say it every time. I buy this two kilo tub of Greek yogurt. I smash Greek yogurt every morning and love it. You know, I have probably eat four kilos a week, too much, but, you know, whatever. I love it. And that was 8.50 in uh, December. I just remember these sorts of things. It's now, you know, 
I think it's sorry, eight bucks in December and it's nine fifty now. Mm. And that's just one thing. But yep. it's like that across the board. You know, milk, yep. everything like butter is the biggest one. Those little tiny two hundred and fifty gram butters. It used to be about a dollar at Audi, a dollar twenty, and now they're three fifty. So um, you know, dairy for some reason has gone up. I don't know what it is, but eggs gone up, hard to get. Um, it's just yeah, it's pretty rampant inflation across all those sort of I guess nest, um, you know, basic foods. Uh, and, and necessities. Um, yeah, it's the way it is, but, you know, uh, it's just it's just life. And that's the official, you know, the official CPI, of course, is probably understating it, particularly, again, those people who are actually at the more stressed end of the spectrum, you know, they're not sending, spending money on new TVs and things which have actually come down relatively in value over time. So, Oh, yeah. Actually, look, that that is one thing that's um, – my father-in-law bought a 75-inch QLED uh, Samsung TV. It's mm. pretty awesome, actually. Um, and it got it for like 2500 bucks. I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're – um, so, that, yeah, those even a year or so ago are probably four grand. Yep. But, you know, there's only so many TVs you need. Correct. Like, yeah, that's, and that's and that's the point. Uh, now, just on that, you know, the CPI is now going to go monthly from yeah. later in the year. Finally, yeah. Although, oh, although finally, finally catching up the rest of the world. Although, if you read the methodology, it sounds as though it's not going to be hugely accurate. No, nah, it's, it's just going to be indicator. Yeah, but it, but it could be good for trends. Mm. So it's, it'll be it'll be one of those things where you still have to rely on the quarterly one to get the proper read, but you'll get yep. might you'll get, get might get some turning points. You know. Yeah, but. Same time, we've got the Westpac, um, the Westpac inflation gauge. Sorry, yes. not the, that's right, the Melbourne Institute one. Yeah, the Melbourne Westpac Institute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which actually um, pre- pretty accurate generally, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Mm. So, so pretty much, you got that anyway for yeah. the monthly gauge if you want to use it. It's, mm. but it yeah, it, yeah. It, it's good. The good. The uh, ABS is doing that. It's about, mm-hmm. about that bloody time, really. Like <laughs> honestly, if you look at some of the statistics they put out, it's, there's a lot of garbage in there. It's um, a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But I mean, like. Just, it, it, you get all these releases. I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, mm-hmm. It's just um, they come up with some new survey that's I don't even know what it's for. Mm. Um, maybe it's because I'm an economic nerd and I just like the main stuff. But um, you know, and you sort of think, well, why are they doing that when they haven't done a monthly CPI? Like we, you know, at the moment that'd be pretty damn handy. Uh, mm, you know? Absolutely. Um, and, and you know, even better, a monthly wage growth one if you could do yeah. do that as well. Yeah. But uh, as part of it. But uh, yeah, that's good on them, I guess. Um, Better late than never. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, there was an interesting question from, from Jason M earlier on. Um, I didn't put it up earlier because we we're, were talking about other things, but he was actually talking about fusion, you know, the, these new the energy um, uh, um, concept. And, uh, you know, his suggestion was, well, maybe we're getting quite close to it, but should we just leave it to the corporations to do it in the private sector? I mean, you know, going back to this idea of uh, leave, it, leave it all to the Private sector and letting on with it, right? Is, is that make, yeah. Does that make sense? Does it not? Well, I'm probably the right guy to ask. Jason, uh, I'm sure in a few weeks or whatever, you'll probably have Dave Lowell and Smith on here. And um, he, he's the energy guy at uh, Macro Business and Nucleus. So effectively, um, I, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in that stuff because I'm not. Uh, <laughs> and I'd just be BSing you. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't actually know anything about fusion. Um, sounds interesting, although... It sounds a bit like, um, you know, Doc off uh, Back to the Future. I think he was talking about fusion when he was he was putting stuff in his DeLorean. Yeah. Uh, but that but that, that's about my expertise on it. So I'm not going to pretend to know. Uh, maybe save that one for Dave because Dave's. Yeah. Well, you know, that, we'll we'll set, definitely come back to it because I think there's actually a very interesting debate about energy policy more generally, right? And uh, yeah. nuclear and fusion versus, um, you know, renewables versus oil and gas and all of those things. And there's some big decisions that people have to make ahead. Um, it's interesting, of course, that um, because of the gas pressure and because of the way that gas prices flow into energy prices, there's now a, a quest to find more oil and gas, and <laughs> that sort of flies in the face of what we've been doing. And you know, there's a bunch of complicated questions. So we'll probably have to get DLS back on to specifically talk about the broader picture about energy security. Yeah, I yeah, I, 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 I can certainly talk on the on, on the high level stuff about mm. you know gas and whatever and how 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 much we're getting rogered, but. Um, you know, it does make me incredibly angry. Like I, I, I was saying in the, I don't know, whatever you call it, the, the green room before we went on mm. it, um, I got my gas bill in Melbourne last week and um, it was $800 for 60 days. Now, I do use gas for heating a bit and I use it for my water. That's it, like to heat my water. But 
I'm not the sort of guy, you can tell I'm a bit of a tightwad. So I'm not the sort of guy who just leaves my gas running all day. I don't, um, you know, use it sort of semi sparingly, uh, never put it on at night, don't sleep with it. You know, usually when we get up and then in the evening when putting the kids to bed, all that sort of stuff, because, uh, you know, you can wake up and get bloody cold in your melon. So, but we don't have run all day. In fact, you know, a lot of days we don't run at all. And that's like $12 a day for some days we don't even run it except to heat your water. And it was $250 more than last year's bill when I'm almost certain we would have used more gas. I didn't measure it because we had lockdowns and all four of my family were home. At the moment, my kids are at school. My wife works two days a week, so I'm here by myself. And I guarantee you, I don't run the bloody gas when it's just me because um, I'm just put on clothes. Um, and so it was $250 more than last year. And then that one was like 100, or 200 bucks more than the year before. So I've had this sort of hyperinflation in gas. And that's just a little personal, you know, personal anecdote about um, how we're getting absolutely ringed by these gas gas companies. And that's before the price, the real price increases have even kicked in. So it's going to get worse. And, you know, it makes my blood boil. My brother actually works at Origin and, uh, and I'm with Origin. <laughs> I sent him a pretty nasty text about it. Uh, not that this is fault, but um, yeah, what we've done with the gas market here and ergo the electricity market is an absolute bloody disgrace. It makes my blood boil. Yeah. And it was actually because uh, politicians bowled, bowed over to the big energy entities, the big energy entities, which are mostly owned by overseas players, yeah. um, aren't really you know worrying about what what, what do they worry oh, about international contracts we're, we're, yep. yeah yeah we're, we're, we're just basically someone someone to exploit for profit yep. they don't they got no they got no ties to us they don't care we're just uh you know um just an econo economic input and look it's not just the energy companies it's a lot of economists were absolute delusional idiots on mm. this and i'll call out one i'm going to call him out directly i call him out of macro business um you know the grattan institute's tony wood former origin director, he um, he was lobbying actively against gas reservation, got the quotes, got it all, 20, 2013. Yep. He called on WA to get rid of their gas reservation policy, saying it's, oh, it's economically inefficient, this sort of stuff, you know, all the usual stuff. Um, I called him out on macro about three weeks ago, said Grattan, Grattan cannot be trusted on energy, where, where have they been during this whole crisis, pulled out Tony Wood's old, um, old quotes, all that sort of stuff. And surprise, surprise, he... Week later, he's in the AFR demanding gas reservation and um, and also super profits taxes. So good on him for flipping, but he was part of the problem. And um, he only flipped because they basically called him out. That's that, that that's it. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of economists across the country who are the same. They got this. They believe in the market. They got they believe in the you know this this magical hand that's going to get does everything more efficient and it's economically inefficient to have reservation and can you imagine if WA had actually listened to that guy and it got rid of the reservation policy well guess what they wouldn't be paying five dollars fifty per gigajoule for their gas while we're paying forty bucks plus while we were yep. paying forty dollars plus yep um, you know they 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 they're living large off cheap gas um, you know and we're going to get to the stage where a whole bunch of people from Eastern Australia are going to move. To emigrate across to Western Australia for cost of living reasons. They've got yep. cheap housing and they've got cheap energy. And those are two ingredients for, uh, you know, for a happy life. And they've, and they've got the second highest incomes in the country. So um, why wouldn't you? Uh, and they you know, they wouldn't be in that, that, that situation if they'd followed this guy's advice and got rid of the reservation scheme. They'd be in exactly the same situation as us here on the East Coast. So, um, you mm -hmm. know, it's not just governments. That governments were getting pressured by, you know, quite frankly, economists and yep. others who should know better. Yep. Economists and big accounting firms and all the other people swearing by the market, right? And yep. I, I come back to this fundamental point, right? There are some basic services like water and, and, and power and those sorts of things, which are just services that need to be provided at the lowest cost possible to enable the benefit of the community. I don't see any great reason why there should be a huge profit element in that at all. No, should be they should, well. I mean, they should really be publicly owned. But yep. quite frankly, look, I, I learned in third year economics. I remember back in the late nineties. So this is one of the few things I do remember from university is the regulation of natural monopolies. And you have there's basically two forms that that took place. One, and this is the best to do in this situation, is cost plus pricing. Mm. So effectively, the LNG cartel, the gas cartel, pulled gas out of the ground at about five bucks, according to the A Triple C report. 
Well, we should be setting a gas price of no more than $7 and make a ginormous super profits tax above that. Let them pull it out at five and make a $2 margin. That's fair. That, that's cost plus pricing. Yep. But instead, you know, when they, were, they were charging us 40, 40 bucks. And the hilarious thing is over the whole U- Ukraine Russian thing, their cost base has been dead flat at five dollars. Yep. It hasn't, hasn't moved. Yep. Yet the prices were about seven dollars pre Ukraine and then they went up to about forty. And they would have gone up to about eighty if the regulator hadn't stepped in. So the um, you know, cost plus pricing is how all these things should be regulated. Or, you know, alternatively, in some cases you can probably do rate of return regulation, but in the case of the gas cartel, you you'll not do that because they've sunk, you know obscene amounts of money in their LNG plants and they just, that's the reason why they're not paying tax at the moment. They're writing off these yeah, huge, huge, huge losses they're yeah. going to be doing for the next decade, yeah. which is, you know, tough luck. You you made the investment, it was malinvestment. Why the hell should we, you know, suffer the consequences? Yeah, good old so, taxpayer um, standing up, standing up again. Thank you, taxpayer. It's just cool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, whilst we pay, pay these effectively private taxes, the same with Transurban, et cetera, when you, you know, when you, uh, as you know, Martin, oh, you, you live in, uh, you don't live quite in Sydney, but if you did live in Sydney still, um, you can't drive anywhere now without Transurban putting their hands in your pocket. Mm, all right. And, <laughs> you know, One of the reasons why I left Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh mate, I, I look look. Melbourne's got like one or oh, one or two toll roads, like oh. one that you use semi regularly, which is CityLink to the airport. If you want to drive north, but you know we, we we've got a couple. Mm. Like there's not that many. Um, doesn't you know? Some people get if you on that certain bit you get hit, but like I could drive weeks without going on a toll road if I want. You can't do that in Sydney. No, absolutely. <laughs> it's just it, it's they, they've got they've got the hand. It's the, it's the most tolled city in the world. Yep. And Transurban has just got its hooks in here and there, everywhere, you know, rising, uh, increasing toll toll rates by obscene amounts. It's just, it's just a, a, a ridiculous. I agree. Now, let me just put this one up from Jason. Um, and I say, Jason, thanks for the earlier super chat. Um, my question is more about what happens if private gains control the tech, meaning the energy supply, and we have to pay what they elect to charge, which is precisely what we've been saying. And mm. that's the problem, right? With the next generation of, of energy, there's a risk that it's going to be set up precisely the same way with precisely the same, um, you know, stupidity where effectively we pay, we pay through the nose and uh, the uh, corporations set the price. That's, that's yeah, the yeah. fundamental problem. Well, then, that, yeah, well, then that, that gets down to you got to have proper regulation where, um, you know, where basically the... <laughs> You just can't see it happening in Australia, can you? <laughs> um, but but you should have proper regulation where where the you know government steps in, they regulate that pro- that that natural monopoly, and, yeah. and and you know do some sort of rate of return regulation. But yeah. um, you know we don't do that here. We just let the let let the robber barons go nuts, yeah. and, oh. and, and and then we, and then and then we have a whole bunch of people who defend it. Like oh, it's just free enterprise. Uh, uh, absolutely know. right. Well, it basically, my my view is that in Australia. Uh, you have a little thing on your wallet that says, open your wallet and say, help yourself, right? And the big end of town come and say, well, thank you very much. We'll have some of that. Yep. And now uh, I've got uh, 95% for and out know. it goes. I know. It's just, it's just nuts. I mean, the hilarious thing is every time I see the uh, the monthly trade data now mm. um, from the ABS, it's like mm. massive trade surfaces and all yeah. that stuff. It's meaningless. Of course because, it is, because it all goes out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, it is It is now. Like, we don't Because we don't, we don't have any, um, you know, like because we don't have any super profits taxes or anything, they barely pay any tax anyway. Yep. Um, especially with gas, gas mm. is the worst worst case of that because they don't because they've got these big sunk costs in the LNG plants. They don't even pay you know proper income tax or anything. You don't get corporate profits, uh, you know proper corporate taxes off them even. But um, you know it's meaningless. Like we're running these ginormous trade trade services, and I think one of the politicians came out. Um, I was the trade minister. I can't remember. One of them just came out the other day saying, you know. Uh, this is why the – no, it was Madeleine King came out and said, this is why um, – so the energy minister said, this is why the mining minerals – uh, mining companies are so important to Australia because they're underpinning our living standards and wealth. I'm like, they're not, no, they're not. because we're not getting the money from it. No. Like, we're, not, we're, not, we're not doing a Norway where we're getting a fair share of that. Hmm. So it's kind of pointless. Like I've almost stopped writing the monthly trade data yep. up a macro because yep. it's pointless. And if yep. I do, I just say big surplus – while we get poorer or not get any of it. Yeah. While whilst like gas bills go up and electricity bills go up. So what's yeah. the point? Like yeah. we'd actually be the the gas market is so perverse that we'd be richer if someone went there with a whole bunch of C4 to those Gladstone plants and blew them all up. <laughs> I mean not not obviously blow them up so there's a fires that never go out, but 
like I sabotaged them so they couldn't work. We'd be we'd suddenly be richer because we'd have this massive oversupply of gas. Yeah. Gas price would crater. We'd yep. all be paying less because yep. we're not getting any gains anyway. Yep. So you might as well just go and blow them up. Yep. That's just point. Like the more we export, the poorer we get. It's perverse. Right. This is why anyway. we need to get, we need to change that. Now um, I'm, in a, I'm, in, I'm in a ranty mood. Yeah, no, so. no, that's fine. Well, at least you're not caffeined <laughs> up this time. I no, no, no I'm actually right? mellow. <laughs> now, um, Jason actually made the point. Uh, we've all been reamed into AU due to the gas nonsense signed up by Scamo. The gas nonsense is unacceptable Australians. We send it to Japan. No, it's actually Labor, it, right? No, it's actually no, it's actually Labor stuff. Yeah, I was going to uh, say. I mean, like, goes like back saw, a long like, way. Yeah, look, I sort of look. I know, I know people like to get, look, ScoMo sucked, the <laughs> coalition sucked. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it, I'm not going to go, Jason. It might, it might have just been a mistake in your part. But I do hate when, when because I read this in The Guardian all the time. Like, you know, Guardian hates the co- anything the coalition does. Mm. They defend Labor. And they're always like, oh, you know, bloody ScoMo, oh, ScoMo set us up. It's Liberals' fault for this gas. No, it's not. It was done under Labor. Like Madeleine King, who's our current energy minister, uh, worked under Gary, what's his name? Oh, I can't remember his name, Gary something or other. Um, and they're the ones who basically set up this system we've got now. They're the ones who decided against reservation, approved the plants, et cetera. All right. So by the time the plants were built, yes, yeah, it was under the coalition, but the system had already been set up. So it was actually Labor who started this mess. Coalition perpetuated it. To coalition's, um, to coalition's credit, they at least set up the domestic gas reservation mechanism uh, a couple of years back. They haven't used it, but they at least set it up. And now Labor's inherited the mess again. So, look, both sides are freaking suck on this issue. They're both culpable. They're both responsible. But I do get annoyed when people go, oh, it's just oh, bloody scum, mate. It's not. It, Labor started this mess and Labor got to fix it. Uh, and I, I'd argue that it's a much more structural issue than just one oh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Rome. It's a no, fundamental no. set of philosoph- philosophers that have actually been in place for at least the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this is why, this is why, like, I only get fired up about it because I hate both sides. So, right. So, so I, you know, I, I, I and Jason, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go at you, mate, because you, you're probably not like this at all. But it's just, you know, um, but, Often people you meet, they're like pro. The, you're a pro Labor guy, you're a pro Liberal guy, and they treat it like football. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, oh, that's my team, that's my team. It's like they, they both suck. Yep. Uh, so it's just, uh, yeah. Well, it's, good on they're you, actually the, agree, they're Jason. actually on the same team. Yeah, it, right? it, it's Pepsi and Coke. It's like it's almost exactly. the same ingredients, <laughs> exactly. ingredients, slightly different formulation, but they're almost the same. You know, so <laughs> yeah. it's just, um, yeah, they're both corrupt. They're both the. And, and, and the thing about it is, Labor set it up, but I'm sure, I, I can't remember what happened at the time because it was like, um, you know, you often forget what the uh, uh, what the opposition say at the time, but I'm sure the coalition was pressuring Labor not against reservation as well. Mm. So they were both culpable. Yep. So you didn't have anyone standing up in the national interest. Luckily, the WA government was smart enough to do it. Um, <laughs> and now look at them, they're laughing at $5.50 flat gas price. It'll be a whole crisis and we're getting reamed. Yep. So, um, you know, it makes me always want to pack up. If WA wasn't so far away, I'd consider it, but I'm not moving there. <laughs> it's just too far. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just before we go, one last slide which you had, which is one to touch on the immigration, migration, net arrivals, right? It's worth yep. just highlighting that all of this conversation about rentals and lack of supply. This is in a situation where net arrivals are still well below where they were previously. Yeah, totally, totally. So, so, so this data came out today. Well, the... Net permanent long-term arrivals data came out today. And what I've done here is I've basically, um, this isn't fresh data, I've tracked it against the net overseas, the official net overseas migration numbers. So that the quarterly net overseas migration numbers are in blue. I've turned the net permanent long-terms into quarterly data, and that's in red. Um, the net permanent long-term migration data leads the net overseas by about six months because we've only got data up to December for net overseas migration. But regardless, they're both showing that um, effectively, immigration's yet to rebound. Uh, so, you know, it's been a very tepid rebound so far from the pandemic. Um, in fact, it stalled a little bit, you know, in the last quarter. Um, and so, you know, th- this is all backward looking uh, to, to June. So, you know, immigration hasn't rebooted yet, it's still very low. And because of that, we're probably going to have a good labour market print. Oh, sorry, not just because of that. I mean, immigration doesn't set the labour market on its own. But um, the fact that labour supply is still not growing quickly for immigration means that unemployment is going to 
remain very tight, other things equal. Um, but of course, again, December one and two, sorry, September one and two, but the Jobs and Skills Summit, the Trojan Horse, where you know we're going to have basically lobbyists from left, right, and centre, you know, counting the accountancy lobby, the property lobby, all the business lobbies, all the hospitality industry, everyone demanding the biggest rise in immigration in the nation's history. And the unions, unfortunately, aren't pushing back. They've um, they've just you know, gone for trinkets or, you know, promise some vague promise that, that to boost training. Um, so they're going to rubber stamp it. And so come the budget in October, we're going to have, you know, a huge increase in um, the permanent migrant intake. And, and on top of that, Labor's vowed to, you know, let those 500,000 temporaries back in uh, stat. So, um, yeah, it's I can't see it staying long, uh, low for long. I think next year we're going to have a... Well, the way it's shaping up, we could have the biggest immigration boom ever, provided this they still want to come here. Mm. And of course, the implication of that is that wages growth will be very, very anemic as a result of this, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so unfortunately, you know, obviously, real wages have uh, gone back. Mm. Uh, I wish I put that that, that chart in here too. <laughs> oh man, I got so many charts I could have put in here. But anyway, the um, so basically, if you there was a great one done by uh, Alex Joyner. Um, from IFM, he's the chief economist there, and he put one up on Twitter and I posted it the other day. It was just great. He, he basically grabbed the wages growth that we've had up until March. The June figures come out tomorrow. Uh, and then he's extrapolated the statement of monetary policy from the RBA's projections. And what it shows is that real wages are going to fall back to tw- 2011 levels yep. if the RBA's forecasts come right. Yep. Uh, so we've got, we've got this situation because inflation's high, wage growth still crap, like still below 3%. Um, Tomorrow is probably going to come in at 2.7% annual if you, you go by the CBA's data. Um, you know, real wages going back real quick. And obviously, if you're going to ramp up immigration massively and have labour supply boom, um, that's going to raise unemployment and other things equal. And it's going to mean that there's less pressure to get you on know, wage growth. So it's going, to, it's going to remain, it's going to be basically what we had the last 10 years yep. where, where we had constant high labour supply, unemployment elevated and low wage growth. So we're going to guess, just repeat the same lost decade we had last year. Oh, sorry, last decade. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's great for the elites, great for big property, big business, the education migration industry, like universities who sell to international students, all that sort of stuff. Not so good for the average Joe who has to, you know, see the wages shot while their housing costs go up and yep. obviously livability indicators suck. So. 10,000 10, 10, student migrant uh, applications a week coming into the universities at the moment. Yeah, I'm not surprised. But surprisingly, I'm going to post this tomorrow. The uh, That net overseas, uh, that permanent long-term arrivals data that came out today from the ABS mm. actually shows that it's stalled. So it hasn't rebounded at all, the international student arrivals. Um, sorry, it's rebounded a little bit, but it's way below where, where it's pre-COVID level. So... Those have yet to rebound yet too. Um, now, again, you know, if we take the Albo, the Albanese government at its word, um, next year it's going to come back big time. Yep. So, uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy the it's a calm before the storm, really, is what I'm saying uh, right now. And you know, I think next year it's and and, and the, the weird thing is they could. You know, potentially ramp up immigration to record levels at the same time as the economy's getting yeah, smashed absolutely. at RBA rate hikes. So yeah. we could end up effectively... In, into a recession. Yeah, that's right, into yeah. a recession. But, yeah. but if obviously if you juice up population growth enough, you might avoid a recession like we did in 2008 yeah. just by quantitative peopling. Yep. So, the, so, the, so the, the overall pie of the economy stays the same, but the per capita pie shrinks. Yep. So you think you've got a per capita recession. Yeah. But um so your wages you know, it will continue to be devalued, right? Yeah, the value yeah. of your and property will continue to go down. Right? Per, and per capita GDP yeah. could shrink. Absolutely. But but the overall pie, just because you've got weight of numbers yeah. coming in. Correct. Um and that's what know, that's my, my theory is that's what they're banking on. Oh yeah. And and, and that's that's basically been the Treasury's policy yep. for you know, their their three P's framework. Yep. Uh, as I said earlier, the only P two P's that matter are participation and productivity. Those actually grow living standards, but the productivity the most. Like participation, you're working harder. In fact, you're working more hours. Um, and that, yeah, that boosts living standards, but you're still working harder. Productivity is the only sort of free lunch you get. 
Yep. But the um, population growth just grows the grows the pie. It doesn't give everyone a greater share of the pie. Mm. Like, it's pretty pointless, really. I think. Yep. Well, but, it goes um, back to what what is the economy there for? What's the purpose of what all this stuff that we're doing? Right. Because it yeah. seems to me that if you actually believe it's just to create profit for the 1%, that's one story. But if it's actually about creating a more livable um, place for everybody else and actually you know, making society better and all those things, those are the sort of things I value. But unfortunately, they don't seem to be valued from a treasury or a political perspective. Oh, totally. And look, you only have to look at the Scandinavian countries. Yep. Right? So you go back to 1960 and uh, we'll take Sweden, for example. Uh, Sweden and Australia's population was roughly similar. So Australia had 10 million people, Sweden had eight and a half. So, I mean, well, you know, we, we, we had a bit more, but not much. Um, fast forward to today, Australia's got 26 million. So we've gone up, you know, we said 160% or something. Mm. Uh, and Sweden's gone from eight and a half to about 10.5 million since 1960. So they've they're been very, very slow growth, like 25% increase, I think it was, of population growth for them. And we've, so we've gone like that, they've gone like that. Well, it's like, I know they're a smaller country in, in size, in um, geography, but it's like this, and Norway, Denmark, Finland are all the same. They're all about the same population growth, about 25% over, what's that, 60, about 60 years versus our 150%, roughly. Um, it's like they've gotten by just fine. And in fact, they've got the highest living standards in the world without running on this stupid population Ponzi policy. Mm. Now, I wouldn't for a second say that our population should have stayed at, you know, 10 million or whatever from 1960 because we were too small then, couldn't defend ourselves, blah, blah, blah. But I think we passed the the ideal level probably, you know, 20 years ago, really, yep. to be honest yep. with you, uh, when the population was about 20 million at the turn of the century. Um, and and it's sort of got the well. stage now where we're getting diseconomies yep. of scale. Yep. Um, especially if you live in Sydney or Melbourne. I mean, you know, you've lived in, you've lived in Sydney, I live in Melbourne. It's gotten, Melbourne was a lot better at 4 million people than it yeah. is at 5 million. Well, the travel times are a lot more extended than previously. The costs of getting around yeah. is a lot more, you know, there's, there's a bunch of reasons to suggest that it's less livable now than previously. And that's my point, really, that it, yeah. if, if, if the real objective of all this is just to make more money for the 1%, why do we bother, right? Exactly. But there's a different set of imperatives and objectives which is creating this livability and those sorts of things, which actually I think are more important. But uh, that's oh, um, totally. politically not necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily mainstream, but I still think it's pretty pretty important. No, mate, it's 100%, but unfortunately, and I think most people view it that way, and mm. certainly if you look at the opinion polls on, uh, there's a whole bunch of them came out last yep. year. On, yep. right, I'm talking about the immigration issue here. It's mm. not just that. It's on, it relates it's to border, everything. It's yeah. But, but the, the problem is it's the, it's those that pull the uh, leader's strings are again those three big property, you know, big business, big property. Yep. The education migration. I'm adding them now because they they're now one of them. Yeah, you should absolutely add them. Yep. They're, 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 yeah. They're 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 oh, mate, I can't yep. stand them now. Like I, <laughs> I, I, I've become anti-university now. I, I like I went to uni and all that, but I just, to see the way they behave now, yep. how the standards have dropped, how it's just become this. Yeah, that. The university vice chancellors now are like the worst CEOs now, like the most profit hungry Well, they've been CEOs. driven the same way. They're actually thinking about, you know, units of production. Yep. Nothing about quality of production. And, no, um, no, no. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not about like higher learning now. No. It's just about how high are earning. It's just mm. a joke. So, um, you know, and I speak to young people who, look, I, I do boxing. So I've got, um, you know, whole, like boxing's a young man's game. I'm, not, I'm like one of the old farts in there now. But, you know, you speak to a lot of guys also going through university, so guys and girls. Yeah. They're going through university. I'll talk about this stuff to them. And, man, like, you, the, the crap they've got to put up with at university now is nothing like it was for me in the mid-'90s. Mm. Um, like, the, you, you talk to them about every assignment now is pretty much a group assignment where it's the same, same exactly what you think. You get paired up with a couple, you know, people who don't speak English, whatever, and you got to, and they got to basically do all the work because, and, and you know, if they go and complain, the lecturers go, oh, um, well, you've got to learn how to work in a team. I'm telling mm. you, I didn't do one assignment through my whole bloody four years of university in a group, or maybe one, but it wasn't—it wasn't really marked properly. No, it was like a no, no, no. Thing. no, no. It was all done individually, and yeah. and you know, but now it's because they've got to carry through. You know, it's, it's just the standards have just been aggregate trashed. aggregate marks and making sure you actually hit the numbers. Um, yeah. Leith, we're running well over time. I want to say thank you very much for uh, your sharing your thoughts. Evening, really appreciate it on the charts and everything. If people want to uh, read more of your stuff, where do they go? 
Yeah, so just go to macrobusiness.com.au is where I post stuff daily. Um, i got to warn you, though, I've been hitting the property market pretty hard at the moment because I'm just sort of doing a real-time um, train wreck on it. Uh, I, I just enjoy it. It's fun. And look, I blame the readers as well because I guarantee you that one that goes up at midnight every night is the most read article of the day. <laughs> so, so it's just like, you know, hey, where, where there's a demand, there's a, there's a supply. Um you know, that's economics 101 for you. But, um, yeah, so I write about all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, I've been hitting the immigration issue hard. Obviously, property is a staple. Uh, all sorts of stuff. Dave, Dave, my partner in crime, writes a lot on energy um, and markets. Uh, he, he's, he's got a lot of good coverage on energy. Um, after basically toiling away for 10 years for no reward, he's finally mm. getting his day in the sun. And, and you also cover New Zealand as well, because I find that's that right, my, yes. my New Zealand Post and your yours are macro. They both do quite well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah they do. They do yeah. actually. My, yeah, I, I, I didn't do one today. I, I do a couple a week, and yeah. surprisingly, um, I don't know if I should say this, but a couple of the probably if I had to pick our top twenty articles of all time on macro business, I reckon six six of them would be New Zealand. Wow. So they're they're incredibly popular. I, I don't know. I've got a lot of closet Kiwi fans. So um, and and. I just find Kiwi, New Zealand fascinating because they're um, I think very it's a petri same dish. banks. It's a petri dish, yeah. right? And I think they're just ahead of us by about a few months. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. well, they're, they're, they're ahead and they're behind. So they yeah. started hiking rates yeah. in November, but they're more fixed rate than us. Yeah, correct. So they're so we're we're kind of more sensitive to rate rises, yeah. but but they started way early. I and mean, they've got sim- same banking system, um, similar kind of setup. Like their market's probably even more over overvalued than ours. Yes, that's it's it's nuts. But they but they've got like a Sydney, which is their Auckland. So, you know, here, Sydney is the most expensive market by a mile. And then Melbourne, they don't really have a Melbourne. But, um, you know, so Auckland's their Sydney. So there's all these parallels you can draw. Um, it's just interesting. So, yeah, I write about New Zealand a lot. Uh, yeah, just uh, macrobusiness.com.au, write there daily. Um, also do podcasts and work with the Nucleus Wealth guys and girls. Um so yeah, on, on on podcasts with them every couple of weeks. We've got one coming up soon. Um, yeah, just just doing the same thing I've been doing for ten years, basically. So, <laughs> as you say, uh, quite exciting times at the moment, and uh, I think you and I are both having quite a lot of fun at the moment in a sort of weird yeah. way because of all these all these developments and how fast things are moving, all the data and everything. So it's quite an exciting time to be in the middle of it. Oh, it's fantastic. Look, look yeah. anyone, anyone who's watched it here knows who I am anyway, probably, yeah, so you probably absolutely. know where to get me. So, it's, yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Well, thank you very much. Enjoyed it, as always. And um, you must come back again another time and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take the conversation further. So thank you very much. I'm going to take yeah. you offline now. Have no a good worries. evening. And Thanks I'll just very much, everyone. Close the show. See you later, Leith. So there you are, folks. I hope you found that useful. Very interesting conversation. Always love what Leith has to say. Um, I will just make um, this point. Uh, Drew said, can we get Martin's channel to do three people, meaning Robbie versus somebody? Yeah, I have the facility to have more than one guest on at a time. If you want to make some suggestions as to which debates you would like to see, send, send me a note or put them in the comments or whatever. We'll we'll see what we can sort out. I'm very happy to do that. If people are happy to come on and do a, a three-way, it gets quite spicy sometimes. We had... Um, Robbie and uh, uh, Salvatore Babones on some time ago uh, debating China, which was um, a very interesting three-way, got quite, uh, quite spicy. Um, with regards to next week's show, um, Robbie's coming on, actually, and he and I are going to talk about the great Supercon. So we're going to talk about superannuation and how it's uh, playing out and the winners and the losers and who's making money and who's not making money, all of those things. So and we'll set that into the context of neoliberalism once again and, uh, you know, what it all means. So um, mark your diary for that one. And uh, just before I close the show, just to show you that we still have two dogs asleep. They did get up and walk around once, but they've been asleep the rest of the time. I'll take them out for a walk very soon now. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for sharing your Tuesday evening with us and uh, take care. Check in the other shows during the week and uh, check back next week for a conversation with Robbie on superannuation. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. See you later. Bye-bye.